Madam Speaker, Donald Trump, a man, <laughs> a man with whom you have locked horns on many occasions, is braced for potential charges in a hush money case that dates back to 2016. Now, my question for you is, do you really think that this is the right, the looming indictment from the Manhattan DA? Is this the right vehicle for challenging the former president? Or do you think it will just serve to rally his base and improve his competitive chances for the presidential election next year? Well, first, let me thank you for the opportunity to be here. I love seeing all these young women uh, in, in business and, and in professions. Um, I frankly would rather be talking about Samora and Samantha. I always wanted to sing, and my children said, no, Mom. Uh, I still want to be a stand-up comedian, so I was listening attentively to Samantha. Uh, weren't they both wonderful? And the whole, uh, the whole presentation today. I think that's a matter for the courts. Uh, the grand jury will vote and decide on the basis of evidence they have as to whether there should be uh, any uh, follow-up to that information. So it's not for any of us to say whether he should be indicted or not. It's a basis of the law and the facts, and that's up to, to the court. So that's all I'll say about him, because I, as with Samantha, don't really like talking about him. That I'm sure you I, don't. <laughs> I, I'm sure you don't like talking about him, but I'm sure it's also a subject that you find hard to escape, so I'm afraid I'm going to stay on it for a little bit longer. <laughs> I mean, one thing uh, I think the audience would be interested to hear, you were at the forefront of uh, two impeachment um, uh, charges. And one defeat. <laughs> against the, the former president, mm -hmm. and your public rebuffs became, you know, were, were sort of, you know, they even became memes. They were, yeah. they were sort of yeah. applauded. Mm -hmm. And it seems that you were one of the few people who uh, were able to stage sort of effective opposition to Donald Trump. Can you tell us, why do you think that was? Why? Why was it that you were able to stage effective opposition? So this is the kind of evening it's going to be. I thought we were going to talk about how to manage family and workforce and we'll get, we'll work get on, time and, we'll get on and that. things like that. OK, let, let's just put it this way. Um, our country is a great country, the United States of America, and we take great pride in being a great country. Our institutions are strong, and we have a responsibility to our founders to honor the vision that they had about a country based on dignity and worth of every person. Our founding documents did not necessarily reflect that, but they had the wisdom to make them amendable. So in the course of our history, uh, our country has always become more free whether it was the abolition of slavery, whether people, uh, black men having the right to vote, and then, black, then all women having the right to vote, and then uh, respect for marriage equality in the court of the United States, until the Roe v. Wade decision, which took us, which took us backward, because it was a diminution of freedom for women in our country to make their own decisions. So. so so my point is about honoring our country, honoring the oath of office that we take. And when I had no choice but to go forward with uh, uh, the uh, uh, actions that you reference is because I thought that it was justified because that person was not honoring the oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. But there's so much to be positive about and to look forward to and not to be dragged back into that. I thought it was most unfortunate that what's his name put out that thought that he might be. We don't know. We don't know what goes in, in the court, uh, uh, the grand jury. And so all the attention went to that when what we have is so, are so many uh, wonderful opportunities in our country, so many challenges, a war for democracy in Ukraine, their democracy, the world's democracy, a fight between demo de democracy and autocracy that we have to stay focused on and not for political reasons take uh, sides with Putin because that's what somebody that you're talking about has uh, been doing. And, and so, again, uh, it's, let me take us to where we are. We're in this jazz center, a, a great institution for the arts. 
I truly believe, Emma, that the arts are going to bring us together as a country. You heard Samantha, you heard Samora. Whatever your political thinking and the rest, you, you put that aside. You are enjoying things, you're inspired together, you laugh together, we laugh together, we cry together. We, for the moment, forget our differences. We have common ground. So I truly believe that the arts are, so to be here in this great temple of the arts of jazz and to hear two performers talk about their perspective to make us laugh or enjoy the music and the rest, that's a, that's a very positive force. I'm happy that my dear husband Paul is with us tonight, Paul Pelosi. My daughter, Alexandra, who's in the arts, who's creative herself. And our two grandsons, uh, Paul, who plays jazz piano. He studied at Third Street Music School. That's where he studies. And, our, and his brother, my grandson, Thomas. And as much exposure to the arts uh, that we give them, can give them, is, again, about finding common ground. Our founders even respected the arts to this extent. My, one of my favorite quotes is John Adams wrote a letter to Abigail. And in the letter he says, I must study war and politics so that our sons can study science and medicine and other things like that, architecture and the rest, so that their children are free to study music and painting and sculpture, even said embroidery, even said embroidery. But you see an ever-expanding set of opportunities for the next generation demonstrated by the arts, an expression of free freedom, free expression of the arts. Well, so uh, that is, that's what gives me so much hope because that's so much a part of who we are as Americans. Well, that, that's lovely. And, and you're talking about the arts as something that brings people together. And um, leaving aside the former president, I think one of the things that you'll be here, <laughs> that you will be remembered. Leaving with, aside is really a good idea. <laughs> Tonight and beyond. <laughs> but not leaving aside politics yet. You've been very adept at bringing people from across the political spectrum together. You're working with you, Republicans over the years. Mm -hmm. But do you think that that has become more difficult? I mean, I'm, you know, do I sometimes think is the next generation of lawmakers that they aren't as incentivized as perhaps your generation were to compromise? Well, the, let me just say that I'll quote Abraham Lincoln. He said, public sentiment is everything. With it, you can accomplish almost anything without it practically nothing. So when we're talking about trying to bring people together politically, it hopefully is a reflection of what the people would like to see. So as we go forward, our focus has to be on transparency, so people know what it is, bipartisanship as much as is possible, and it's always, it has been more of a challenge lately, and accountability to the people to the people. So I think that uh, the more people pay attention to what is going on and how it affects their lives, the more they will be engaged. And I hope that many more women will be engaged because nothing is more wholesome for the political process than the participation and the leadership of women. I truly believe that. And, and that holds true in, in business and in academic world and all the rest. And uh, because we do believe that when women succeed, America succeeds. But here's, here's my question, and I hate to sound downbeat, but you know, we've seen extreme political polarization. Women in politics, not just here, but around the world, face really virulent attacks. Here, some of it has morphed, not just women, but it's morphed into violence. January the 6th, your own husband got attacked. Why would anyone become a politician these days? Well, you're absolutely right. One of my goals when we went, as, you, as was mentioned, there were very few women in Congress, about two dozen out of 435 members of Congress. Imagine that. I thought, what is this? 
And we made a decision that we were going to increase the number, and we had maybe 100 more than we had then. 90-some uh, on the Democratic side. Republicans are growing their number, and that's good. But we have really, they have, I think, 20-something or 30-something. We have 90-something. Uh, I wear this ring made by women in Afghanistan, close to my heart, for all the suffering that they are going through with the Taliban. I wear this bracelet about Ukraine, about the Ukraine. What is happening to women there is so outside the circle of civilized human behavior. Rape in front of your children, rape in front of your parents, dismemberment, kidnapping of your children. Some of those children, thousands of them, are probably closer to Alaska than they are to Ukraine now because the Russians have taken them in. Uh, that's why I was so pleased that the Court of Justice, the International Court of Justice has, um, has, um, has indicted uh, Putin because he is responsible. I asked someone with great familiarity with the Russian approach to things. I said, isn't it sad how these soldiers are become some brutes? How could they be doing this to these women, to these children, to these families? How could they be doing this? And the person said, make no mistake. A Russian soldier doesn't do anything he isn't ordered to do. This is their policy to demoralize the country so they might, might give up on war because of these rapes and kidnappings and, and murders and the rest. So you write your point that, and, and I mentioned Iran as well, how women are suffering in Iran. But it's not just those three places. There are three that we know about and, uh, very conspicuously at this time, but throughout the world. And in our own country, the lack of respect for women to say, we'll decide the size and timing and if you're even going to have a family. Really? I mean, Paul and I have five children in six years and one week. I hasten to remind my archbishop. And, <laughs> and that's lovely for us. But who, what politician is supposed to make policy to tell a family that at their kitchen table they should be considering what some politician said rather than what their hopes, dreams, and aspirations are for and if they want to have a family. So I, it, it's all about respect. And I think that um, I, I, we, last week, uh, this mo last month, this month, obviously is what you're the woman, but last week we had the um, International Women's Day, so we had whole floods of women coming in from all over the world. Uh, the former president of Liberia, the first woman, elected woman, in African history, in, first, in fact, the first head of state in Africa since Cleopatra. Uh, imagine the courage. And uh, it, it, it just, we really have to make sure and shine a bright light on all of the bad treatment of women throughout the world. And I, people used to, used to ask me when I was a speaker, if you ruled the world, what one thing would you do? The one thing I would do then or now as if I wrote the world, it was the education of girls and women to make, be able to make their own choices, their own decision. That's good for them, that's good for their families, their culture, their countries. And we just, I mean, as I say, when women succeed, whether it's America or another country or another culture, the culture succeeds. But we have to stop the thought that, the, that they could, the Taliban could do what they're doing to the women in Afghanistan, or the Russians could do what they're doing in Ukraine, and uh, the leadership in uh, Iran, really? Poisoning schoolgirls, and, and well, you know what some of it is. And it goes beyond those countries. It is related to respect. It's also related to family planning uh, for those women so that they can be uh, in charge of their own fate. Well, look, we're, we're very lucky to be sitting in a room full of very impressive female business leaders. And I'm sure they'd all be very interested to hear what lessons they could learn from you. And again, one of the things that you're very, you were known for was your ability to rally votes and build, build a consensus. And you were a very effective negotiator. So I think, um, I think people would like to hear what your most effective, what was the most effective strategy for you in getting something, for example, like the Affordable Care Act over the line? You know, what, 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 were your, what, were your, what was your most effective tactic? 
Well, I come back to a word that I had to use, respect. Respect for other people's opinion, respect for the, that we're called, our title is representative, and that's our job description too, to represent the people who have sent us to office. Uh, again, as I see all of these women here and such women, uh, leadership of women in the Wall Street Journal, that's lovely. Congratulations. They're all sitting over yeah, there. Yeah, let's give them a hand, okay? <laughs> Uh, see, I happen to believe, and one of my gripes with your person, you were asking that before, freedom of the press is the guardian of our democracy. Any attempt to diminish that, which was a priority, and that's, that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong, because the more people know, the more they weigh in, the more our democracy, in my view, is protected. And if you don't like the word democracy, freedom, freedom, freedom for people to be who they want to be. So I want to say, since, you're, since I have this opportunity, not necessarily an answer, but a response to the question, is um, to each of you, just have so much confidence. You heard Samantha, so much confidence, so much courage to do what she does. Stand up in front of an audience, put yourself on the line there. But you do that in different ways in your, in your jobs. And remember this, you're the only one, the only one in the history of the whole world that is you. The unique, authentic contribution that you make to whatever you do, whether it's work or family or both or uh, whatever it is, and how special you are. And so you, whatever it is that's a combination of family, of environment, uh, uh, beyond family, of education, experience, whatever it is, it is great because it is you and because it is different. And difference of opinion is a very big strength. That's why we need more women at the table. Not to say that women are better than men. <laughs> But to say you must, you have to have everyone present at the table, whether it's women or people of color or just the, the diversity of our country. So I would say that um, I'm always asked, what would you say to women who might want to be in politics? And it harkens back to your previous question, which I did not forget. And that was, why would a woman want to run for office when you're subjecting yourself to this? How many times I heard that from women when I was encouraging them to be their only authentic, original, individual self and make their contribution uh, to society, to our country, to our culture. And they would say, you know, I could never put my family through that. Mm. I have little children, see, because I came when my children were largely in college. Alexandra was going into senior year in high school but the other four were already in college. But many of them, I'm trying to get younger women to be running in their 20s and 30s, rather 40s for me. And they say, I could never subject my children to that. I, can't, I ran one time, and my, kid, my child came home crying from school because somebody saw an ad on TV which misrepresented who I am. And you just, I, I really honestly believe that we must make an effort because if we reduce the role of money in politics and increase the level of civility in politics, many more women would be holding office and that would be a good thing for our country. But when they then ask me, what advice do you have to women who might want to? And it just isn't about politics, but it's about everything. Know your why. I just say to them, know your why. Why do you think you want to undertake this? to be in Congress or to be in the news business or to be in entertainment or to be in uh, the corporate world or academic world? Why, why should you be the one that has that particular position at that time? And how, if you know your why, everything else is justified. My why, as a mother of five at home, was one in five children in America would go to sleep hungry at night living in poverty. I thought, what? This is the greatest country that ever existed in the history of the world, and one in five children in America goes to sleep hungry and lives in poverty? 
went from my own kitchen to the Congress, housewife, house speaker, and because that was my motivation. And so any of the pain that goes with it is weighing of equities about why you're, why you're there. So if you want to do this, know your why. That means what is your vision? What is it are you interested in? The climate issue, which is a generational issue of our time, if it's a climate, is it education, is it healthcare, is it uh, business? What is it that is your passion that you want to make your contribution in? No. No. The why, the what. Just be knowledgeable. You don't have to know everything. Nobody does. But don't think that you know anything less because you don't wear a tie and a suit. Even if you do wear a tie and a suit, that's OK. But it, is, it, it isn't the secret sauce. Just know your stuff. Know why you're doing this. Know what it is. Know how to get it done. So I always say a, a test of leadership is, what is the vision of that person? What is the vision of that person? What is the knowledge and judgment they bring to this debate and this situation, this challenge? Are they a strategic thinker? Do they know how they're going to get things done? That's all up here. Vision, knowledge, judgment, strategic thinking, and show them what is in your heart, the authentic you we talked about earlier, what you the, the, the sincerity, the authenticity of it all, because the, that is something that is appreciated, needed, desired, and really the most convincing as to why you should be, you should be the one. Uh, it's very exciting. I highly recommend it. Uh, it is um, a lot to be done, and the more women at the table, in my view, well, that's, that's good to hear. I want to ask a much more practical question. And for the record, I would also ask a man this question. I want to know whether you think, or how did the fact of raising five children help you when it came to your later career? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, is that uh, any moms who are here know, uh, you are, um, you, you have to be diplomatic. It's, you know, you're a, resolving conflict from time to time. You have to be a cook. You have to be a, dry, a chauffeur. You have to be quartermaster. You have to be referee. You have to be multitasking. You have to be a manager. It is really quite a challenging job to be a mom. And if you happen to be working at the same time, I'm totally in awe of you because balancing work and home is such a big thing. So what does that mean when I'm talking to these people? Well, I guess mostly um, Emma, it was because of my why. I knew why I was there. I was there for the kids. If they thought that women shouldn't be there or what is that, who said she could be here and all that, that was their problem. That was not my problem. And now I'm so happy that so many women, and Catherine Clark now uh, in the leadership and on our side, and uh, Patty Murray on the other side uh, in terms of uh, a leadership in the party, but it is, um, uh, it's not just about the politics internally. It's the outside. Nothing that we do would be possible. You talked about how we passed the Affordable Care Act. It was important for us to get the votes. But we couldn't get the votes just by talking to the members. It was Lincoln again, the public sentiment. So when, when it looked like we weren't going to pet, well, it never looked like it to me, but when the press was saying, when the press was saying, <laughs> um, when they were saying, this is hopeless, why don't you give up? And others, even in our own party, were saying, you've got to shrink it down. I was like, no, it's not going to happen. So one, one confrontation I had, um, actually, engagement I had with the press was um, they said, how are you ever going to get this done? Why don't you just give up? I said, no, this is the challenge at that time of our generation. We are not going to let this pass. For 100 years, presidents, even Teddy Roosevelt, Republicans, have wanted to get this done, health care, uh, for as many Americans as possible, quality, affordable health care. We're not letting it done. If there's a wall, a gate, a fence in our way, we will break through the gate. 
If that doesn't work, we're going to climb over the fence. If that doesn't work, we're going to pole vault in. If that doesn't work, we're going to parachute in. But we're not going to let anything stand in the way of getting this done because it means so much to the American people to have access to quality, affordable health care. So after it was over, they said, well, which one did you do? <laughs> I said, actually, we walked through the gate. We went through the gate, not just with the number of members of Congress it took to pass the bill, and that was a task, but because of all of the people who wanted it done. Thank God for the nuns who could put off the bishops and what they wanted to do to turn away. They wanted, the bishops in, in the bill wanted to um, eliminate Roe v. Wade altogether, not just in the bill, altogether, but the nuns were there for us. Not, not changing their value system, but understanding that it, that wasn't true what they were trying to do. And so anyway, thank God for the nuns. I always thank God for the nuns. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, just all the people, the, the uh, uh, groups that are, are surround, come together around any diagnosis, any disease, all the rest, the little lobbyists, the children who came to campaign, they helped push up at the gates. So, I always say to people, know your power out there. The outside mobilization makes a difference. And when the time came to protect it from assault, you know, uh, we had 10,000 events in the country where people came and told their personal story of what the legislation meant to them. My child was born with heart disease heart conditioned, million dollars in bills the first year. You know these stories. You've heard them from, from people. 10,000 stories. And that outside mobilization is what helped pass the bill and save the legislation and save millions of lives. It was a great thing. And I guess I'll take us back to where you were in the beginning. So when I go around, I'm so proud of our legislation because this, you know, this is a... a you have to know how to count, and you have to make sure you have your count, and it's a, a lot of persuasion or public sentiment, the rest. So I think it's just such a major accomplishment. I had one of my first bills in Congress over with 35 years ago or 34 years ago was about climate, and I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud of so much legislation because I'm a legislator. That's what I love to do. But everybody just goes... They'd make, repeat all these gestures about standing up to, what's his name? And it's, it's interesting to me because I'm thinking, I've been there like 30 years before he even got there passing bills, and all you're talking about is, well, it's a, we think you saved democracy. Well, hopefully so. We'll see. More Good. to come. Okay. Well, look, we've got some questions. <laughs> We've got some questions from the audience, and two of them are on the issue of gender pay equity. So um, one of the questions is, what do you think is the appropriate role for the government to play in solving pay equity issues? Well, we had this bill introduced every year, every Congress, by Rosa DeLauro. Uh, the other day, last Friday, we celebrated uh, Equal Pay Day. That, that, that was a day established by John F. Kennedy when he when we first passed equal pay. It didn't give people equal pay. It just said that's what they should do. That would be the day that until then, in March, women were working free compared to a man doing the same job. Um, we have to pass that. Here's what we have to do. We talked about women. and uh, Here's what we have to do. Equal pay for equal work. Family and medical leave. Child care, affordable quality child care child tax credit, and support for home health care workers because the care that women and men, this helps men too, uh, uh, do may not be for a child, maybe for a sibling with a disability or something, or it might be for a parent. But when you go to work, when you women go to work, I want you to be there. Obviously, we're always thinking of our families but you can't be thinking, my child is not in a, a, an inadequate child care situation. I have to worry about every phone call. It has to be 
uh, as much as possible, quality uh, and affordable. And that is what we, part of what we tried to do uh, this year, but we did not complete it. And that's what we have to do. Because you know what? The workplace benefits from women being fully there. There's a Latin expression Jerry Brown taught me de decades ago. Ajay Kwadajis, do what you are doing. When you're there, focus, because those who will be promoting you and the rest want to know that you are fully there. And, uh, and sometimes you can't be there. You have to have, that's why we want paid family and medical leave. Some of you have that in the private sector. Most women and men do not have that in our country. But if we're going to really have the benefit of the full diversity of America in our thinking, in our decision making, in a reflection of the needs of the people that we are meeting, we really have to make sure that we're taking care of the children and the family as women uh, are in the workforce. So yes, I think there is a public role to pass it. Uh, we've passed it every Congress in the House, but we haven't been able to pass it with the 60 vote requirement in the Senate. But public sentiment weighing in may make that different in the next Congress. So Madam Speaker, we are more than out of time, but I have two more questions that I want to put to you. Um, you okay think, with that? <laughs> well, <laughs> and send, send any more you have. I mean, one of them is you have said openly that you're backing Biden for president uh, yeah. next year. He runs. What, what advice would you give him or, or what would you tell him to change? What one thing should he change or what should he do differently ahead of that campaign? He's the president of the United States. I don't think he needs any advice from me, but I would give him the same advice I gave to you. Be yourself, the authentic you. This is a man with a great vision for our country, knowledge from years of service, in the Senate, Vice President and President of the United States, therefore good judgment about a uh, direction to take for our country, respectful to the core in terms of bipartisanship. That's how he came up in politics. That's what he knows. And of course, Mr. Empathy himself, Joe Kennedy, heart to heart with the American people. So I think he's a great leader, and I would just say to him what I say to you. When you go out there, just be yourself. Right, and my final question, which is a, a pretty obvious one, but I have to ask it. When is the US going to get its first female president? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I always thought that we would have a female president long before we, a woman president, long before we would have a woman speaker of the house. The Congress of the United States, as you say, a couple dozen out of 435, one or two in the Senate at that time, um, it's a bastion of male pecking order for over 200 years. You're going to do it, and then I'm doing it next, and I'll do it after you, and then you're going to. And so, um, so I always thought, oh, the American people are so much more ready than this place. This is not breaking a glass ceiling. This is breaking a marble ceiling. When women, when we had more women and they were encouraging me to run, uh, the, the, shall we say, humma hummus who were, you know, thought they were in the 200 year line said, um, who said she could run? Oh, make my day, okay. Uh, <laughs> that only encouraged me more. Uh, and then they said, um, the women want that, well, why don't they just write a list of things that they want on a piece of paper and tell us and then we'll do those things. <laughs> We've been telling you for a long time. Uh, but um, I didn't want anybody to vote for me because I was a woman. And I didn't want anybody to vote against me because I was a woman. And I think that we will have a woman president when people see that. I mean, we take great, I mean, I myself took such great pride in Hillary Clinton, one of the best prepared people to run for president. She, she um, all those things, a vision, knowledge, judgment, connection to the people, um, more, more talented than her, more experienced than her husband, than George W. Bush, whom I respect and love, but more talented than that, more than Barack Obama, and he would admit it, 
She had more service, more experience in the rest. Don't even let me go into the next one. And, um, and, that, and in that arena, she would have just been so fabulous. It didn't happen. And I, I, I think um, there's still more we have to do in terms of convincing people that women, a woman could be a commander in chief. That was something I was getting back. What commander in chief? Yeah, a woman can be a commander in chief. Uh, that, that um, uh, let's face it, I mean, I, I, I don't go into this a whole lot, but there's a lot of misogyny in the whole operate, you know, in our society still. We shouldn't be held back by that. As I said earlier, that's their problem. But we have to recognize that there is some of that. So, I mean, in my case, I got to be speaker because I went out there and won the election, took, got the majority, and there they are. And it's about the election, and that's what a woman president will be about the election, too. I hope it was soon. I think it would send a message to the world uh, that and people say, well, we had a prime minister in England, we had a prime minister in, in, in India, and we had this, and we had that, and how come the United States is so far behind? But I think it's important to consider this. In those countries, they're parliamentary governments. What you have to do is be the leader of your party and then have your party win more seats in parliament. And it's just a fight within your party, the winning party, as to who will be the leader of the party and, their, then the, as, and the prime minister. Here it's an election by everybody in the country for president of the United States. That is a really different challenge. So we shouldn't be diminishing ourselves by saying we never did that, but we should just, just do it. I just have to leave you with one thought because this is my sort of tattoo. When you go into that arena, all of you I'm talking into running into office and ignoring the bad stuff the other side might do in terms of ads, Remember your why, and my why are the children, as I said. The, um, Teddy Roosevelt, notice I've not put Teddy Roosevelt, Lincoln, two Republican presidents. They, uh, Teddy Roosevelt said that, um, um, he talked about the arena. If you have, don't know his speech, you should read his speech. It's so fabulous about the arena. You're in the arena, you're no longer a spectator. You're an actor, you have to get the job done. So I say to the women, um, in my case, the children side of things, uh, so when you're in the arena, you have to be prepared to take a punch. It's rough, it's rough in the arena. And you have to be prepared to throw a punch for the children. 